The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Voyager episode, Jetrell. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Folks, be sure to follow The Secrets of Star Trek in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or on the StarQuest YouTube channel, where you should also make sure to hit the bell to get notifications. Uh, I want to tell you about another show on the network you are sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Stargate. You can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Stargate. So, Jimmy, can you give us a recap of this episode? This week, a Cardassian claiming to be Eamon Maritza comes to the station, but Major Kira hates him and has reason to suspect he's really a war criminal who committed atrocities after the Cardassians conquered Bajor. He also has a fatal disease. He is lying, but he's racked with guilt for what has happened during the war, and he's pretending to be a file clerk, pretending to be a war criminal, pretending to be a file clerk. Major <laughs> Kira goes through emotional twists and turns with the revelations of what's really going on, before finally making peace with him as he lays dying in bed in sickbay. Oh, uh... Sorry, that's Duet, the better episode of Deep Space Nine that this episode of Voyager rips off. In this episode, a scientist named Jatrell comes to Voyager and wants to examine Neelix. Before Neelix's home planet was conquered by Jatrell's race, Jatrell developed a weapon that killed everyone on the moon on which Neelix's family was living. So we have an atomic bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki allegory. Neelix initially hates Jatrell and wants nothing to do with him. But he says Neelix may have a disease caused by the weapon, and he says that a medical scan can confirm this. And he does the scan and says Neelix does have the disease and will die. But then he gets the idea to use Voyager's fancy Alpha Quadrant transporter technology to isolate the isotope that causes the disease from the atmosphere of the moon so that they can develop an antibody to cure it. And this has to happen really fast, because the war criminal has the disease himself and only has days to live. They go back to the moon and isolate a sample of the atmosphere, but instead of doing what he said he would, Jutrell does a different experiment. It turns out that Neelix doesn't have the disease, Jutrell lied about that, and he's racked with guilt for what he did during the war, and has been working on a way to reconstitute the victims of his weapon and return them to life using the transporter. He and Neelix convince Janeway to give it a try, but it doesn't work. Jatrell then spends his final hours in sickbay, and Neelix, who has been going through the emotional ringer with the twists and turns of the revelations of what's been going on, forgives Jatrell as he is dying. The end. Bummer. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was a great Deep Space Nine episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, that was really good. Interesting, though, there is there is a DS9 connection here, a, a better one. Uh, James Sloan, who played Jatrell, also played Maura Pohl, who was the scientist who originally investigated Odo for the Cardassians. Mm -hmm. Right. So he was on DS9. Yeah, he was in several Star Trek roles, uh, beginning with Next Generation, and this one here on Voyager was his final role. Yeah. Yep. So I have to say, I generally don't like Neelix episodes of Voyager. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, although this is, if I were to rank them, would be among the better of them, which is yes. a low bar, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, with two Vox for, being at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, for, oh, you mean two Vix or? Two Vix, that's right, two Vix. Oh, yeah. I like two Vix. It's oh. stupid, but I like it. <laughs> okay. Janeway is war criminal. Yeah. 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 N Neelix isn't quite as annoying in this one as usual. He actually is a somewhat sympathetic character in this one. Yeah. Right. His, I have in my notes, his relationship with Cass is the most functional it's ever been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. You know, uh, it's interesting. You mentioned that there's, it's a clear uh, metaphor for the Hiroshima bombing. And mm -hmm. 
I find it weird that Michael Piller, who was the executive producer, rejected that idea that this was a metaphor. I'm like, how could it not be? <laughs> this is clearly Hiroshima. Yeah. You know, yeah. right down to the people the who have who have been horrifically maimed in the yeah, blast. The, yes. The the burned girl that um that Neelix describes at one point, who is then in his dream represented by a burned Cass. Mm -hmm. This is exactly like the ant people at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's what they were called because they mm. were like crawling over the ruins like ants. Ugh. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, th so the, the theme clearly here, well, part one theme in, in, in this story is the idea of forgiveness of an enemy. Like someone who has done something so horrific, can you can you ever forgive someone who's done something so bad? And I think that's a good ex thing to explore in science fiction because it removes it from within the, the immediate context of American, mm -hmm. of human history, not American history, human history. And that's what, that's what science fiction does well is by taking it out of that context and making it a little more objective to look at again. So I'm glad we're, we're yeah, talking about except, it at least. Except when yeah. they do it and it sucks. Because <laughs> right. they're not they're not interested in a complex exploration of a complex subject. They're interested in preaching at the audience, mm -hmm. right? And here, they're here. the The message is not nuclear weapons bad. Um, right. mm -hmm. They 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 play Jatrell and Neelix as with enough complexity that it's neither one of them is clearly just right about everything. And right. neither one is clearly just wrong about everything. Right. They're both right about some things and wrong about other things. Because one of the things we find out in this episode, even I didn't cover it in my recap, but one of the things we find out about Neelix in this episode is he has been lying about his war service history. Mm. Right. He has been portraying himself as a hero when really he was a deserter. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things that come up in the beginning, we have this, uh, we're at Sandrine's where they're playing pool um, in a bit of a metaphor of uh, Neelix having to take, to take the, the uh, heroic sacrifice, not, yeah. right. And, and, and sort of uh, taking the, the, not taking the coward's way out, the safe path. Um, but why does Neelix always call Tuvok Mr. Vulcan? He doesn't call anyone Mr. Human. I, I don't understand that decision in the right. Tuvok is the only male Vulcan. Well, I mean, he isn't just, though. It, 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 well, he's the only he's he's the one Neelix knows and hangs out with. Yeah, and yeah. I've always just taken it as this is just Neelix's pet, app, you know, nickname for him. I guess mm -hmm. it's really annoying because <laughs> because clearly Tuvok dislikes the, it when he does that. He does, and that's exactly it. why he does it. Yeah, <laughs> he's teasing yeah, and, him, and it goes all the way back to the first episode. I mean, that that's you know. Yeah. I think if I remember right, like Tuvok introduced himself. I'm a Vulcan, you know, named T Tuvok or something like that. And oh, Mr. Vulcan. And then Neelix says, yeah, so Mr. Vulcan. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so we have the Jatrell showing up. We, you know, uh, we have this ship that approaches the, uh, the Enterprise, the Voyager and uh, Jatrell beams aboard. Neelix recognizes him. Yeah. And the, freaks when, out. And even before the that um, you know the Hakonian shuttle show the ship shows up and um, Janeway summons Neelix to the bridge and says we've got this ship coming into range can you tell us what it is because you know they don't have a lot of knowledge this is a first um, season Voyager episode so they don't have a lot of knowledge of the Gamma mm -hmm. Quadrant yet or whatever quadrant they're in <laughs> um, I always get it in the Delta mixed Delta, up. It's, Delta, this Delta. is the Delta quadrant, yeah. yeah. And he says, oh, that's a Hakonian shuttle. And he's very blasé about it. And he explains that, oh, yeah, 15 years ago they conquered my planet. <laughs> and, he, and it's like, and you're taking this really well so far. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But, uh, but then when Jatrell gets on the screen... Neelix has a very, without saying anything, he, he's clearly becomes very upset and has a very violent reaction because he recognizes Jatrell as the man who built the weapon that killed his family and the moon they were living on. And it's a nice chance for the actor to act yeah. without, and without using words even. It's all done visually. And, and that, is, uh, that is a nice thing. He also, ex we learned that the family lived on this moon called Rhinax of Telax or whatever their planet's Telax, called. Yeah. 
and uh, everyone there has an X in their name. It's <laughs> all of them. Yeah. yeah. But uh, every word in their language has to have an X, I guess. But the guy invented a weapon called the Metreon Cascade. Metreons are some kind of particles, and it killed 300,000 people, and Telex surrendered the next day, which mm -hmm. is like, okay, note to Michael Piller, we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then the Japanese very quickly surrendered. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. This is clear parallel here. Uh, although yeah. there was an attempted coup, a desperate coup in Japan to stop the surrender. But that that's... you can listen to on Mysterious World. <laughs> so Jatrell, meanwhile, is going around basically seeking absolution. As, as, at least this is the, the, the uh, upfront uh, idea. The cover story. Uh, yeah. To help people who suffer side effects from the Metreon Cascade, uh, people who are exposed to the radiation could develop this disease that under that causes this is what they say the atoms of the body to undergo fission they become a nuclear bomb <laughs> well yeah. presumably they don't all fission at once uh, <laughs> okay. but fission fission is just the release of particles from um of uh, i mean it's it's just radioactive decay okay. um mm -hmm. a fission bomb is one where you have a chain reaction of radioactive right. decay happening but if you have a uranium atom, a uranium-235 atom, and it spits out an alpha particle, which is essentially a hydrogen atom, or the core of a hydrogen atom, um, that's a fission. You've had this one atom fission. And it, so it's just a ra radi natural radiation release. And yeah, if you got your body irradiated in ways that made your atoms in your own body radioactive, and then they start fissioning, Mm -hmm. That would do further damage to you. You could get it, you could get radiation mm -hmm. poisoning, and so this disease, metremia, they call it, is a degenerative blood disease that they say can lay dormant for ages and ages and ages, and then suddenly become active. Which really doesn't fit the way radioactive decay works. There should be a bell curve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Neelix uh, finds it suspicious that a man who made it his life's work to develop a weapon to destroy as many Talaxians as possible should suddenly be concerned with one Talaxian's health. Uh, so T uh, Neelix is obviously, you know, suspicious. It's not inconceivable that a guy, this guy, for one thing, may not have been all about developing weapons to kill Talaxians. I mean, that may have been one thing he did, but uh, it is not suspicious to necessarily that someone would want to redeem themselves a bit. Uh, yeah, by helping people yeah. afterward. N Neelix is just being emotional, emotionally, emotionally reactive here. And Janeway correctly tells him, you know, it, he's, he, his story makes sense. He's just trying to help people mm. that he formerly, that he developed the weapon that, that, um, that hurt them. It's not, it's not, it's not absurd for him to want to try to make that right to the extent he can. Right. They also have a nice scene where they're talking about this, where, um, uh, Neelix asks him, he basically asks him, are you sorry for what you did? And this is where they make Jatrell more complex. He says, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry for what happened, but I'm not sorry for what I did. Mm -hmm. I developed this weapon. It was inevitable. It would have been developed. If it hadn't been me, it would have been somebody else. And I wasn't the one who decided to use it. I decided right. to, uh, it, that decision was made by the governmental and military leaders. So I did something that would have happened anyway, and th they then chose how to use it. And one of the things, and again, this is more Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <laughs> um, the, the people who worked on the Manhattan Project had profoundly mixed feelings about what they were doing. And they did not all want to just drop it on Japanese civilians. One of the things that, that Neelix talks to Jutrell about is, couldn't you have just, you know, blown it up somewhere else uh, where it wouldn't kill people? And he's like, yes, but that wasn't my decision that the military political leaders made mm -hmm. that. And that's exactly mirroring what happened at the end of the Manhattan yeah. Project. Robert Oppenheimer and others wanted us to demonstrate it on the bomb on a deserted island to show Japan what we were capable of doing without actually killing anybody. Mm -hmm. And the government and military leaders decided, no, we're going to drop it on civilians. Right. right. They, they decided in both cases, I think it was, if we, if we drop it 
as a demonstration and it doesn't deter them, we've lost our advantage of surprise. I think right. that's like the idea. Well, in any event, it would have a big have a bigger effect if if we do it if we kill people right out the gate. Yeah. Well, and there's also that that parallel of other people had created at the same time our Manhattan project was going on. Germany had a, a parallel project trying to do the same thing. Right. You just have to get there first. And, and Japan. Japan did. And there are even rumors that Japan managed to get a functional bomb that they tested. And we'll mm. be talking about that on Mysterious World in the future. <laughs> yes. I look forward to that. So Jatrell says he's not sorry about developing the weapon. He just that it had a side effect of causing lingering death instead of instant death. And that's what he regrets. Like, if, you know, if the we- a weapon is designed to be used to, you know, if you develop a weapon, you're going to assume it's going to be used to kill people. But it's that lingering death part. And he says, he, like you said, he, he developed it, but the military decided to use it. Is that a valid moral excuse? Like, well, I just made the weapon. Someone else pulled the trigger. In this, especially in the case of a weapon of mass destruction. So if, um, if uh, let, su- suppose you're a knife maker. Mm-hmm. And if you don't make knives, someone else will use them. Mm. And so you make knives and you sell them and some people buy them and use them to commit crimes. Are you responsible for those crimes? No. No. But so there is some validity to this argument. Now, you can then question the analogy and say, okay, do nuclear weapons really belong in the same category as knives or are there relevant differences here? So, and I think that's a debatable issue. What's not debatable mm-hmm. is you can't bomb civilians. <laughs> right. Right. But I think it is debatable because there are legitimate uses for nuclear weapons. Um, uh, if you have a civilianly, sufficiently high value target and uh, there could be situations where you could use it. I mean, uh, uh, back in the, uh, the war uh, with Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden was an extraordinary high-value target who was holed up away from civilian population centers. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's ar- at least arguable that you could use a tactical nuke, which right. are, tactical ones are ones designed to make smaller effects. They're not the big, huge ones. If you knew he's in this valley... And it's just him and his men in this valley and maybe a few civilians, but it's not a civilian population center. He's a sufficiently value, high value target. You could conceivably use a tactical nuke to take out Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. But um, what you can't do is bomb civilians. Mm -hmm. That's that is terrorism. Yeah. Um, I I was thinking of a naval fleet would be another, you know. Thing that you yeah, can yeah. Use a nuke See another. If you got an a, aircraft carrier group of an enemy fleet, you could use a tactical nuke to take out the aircraft carrier, and that would be legitimate. You're out in the middle of the ocean. You're not bombing a civilian center. There is this. It, you mentioned this exchange between Jutrell and, and Neelix it's several times. In one point, Neelix says, "I would rather die than help you ease your conscience," which is a you know intransigent. He's in pain. I get. I get that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't judge him for that. Uh, Jatrell replies, I do believe I can help you. If not you, then others of your race. Isn't that more important than punishing me? Yeah, and I really like that point. I'm glad Mm -hmm. they made it because that was what was going through my mind. It's like, dude, it's not just you he's trying to help. Right. Right. And later on, when you understand some of what Neelix is mad at, it's not just Jatrell, but at himself, it starts to, he's kind of saying some of these things when you read them in that light to himself. You know, the solving, you know, solving his conscience and that sort of thing. Uh, there is an interesting plot, oh, not a whole, but a, a, pro, a plot problem that they just m- move over because they need the plot to go in a certain direction. That is, if the EMH is so skilled, as Kess says, that <laughs> he won't stop until he finds a cure for the disease, then why not let the doctor do all of the work that Jatrell wants to do? Now, they need mm-hmm. Jatrell to do it because he's got an ulterior motive and that whole, all the whole thing. But, um, you know, he does say, well, Jachal's instruments are designed for Talaxian physiology. Right. Well, in, unless Talaxians are naturally radioactive, you don't need a special machine to detect that he's got fissionable isotopes in his body. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and they, they said that his instruments are uniquely tuned for Metreon radiation and all this. And I'm like, Starfleet sensors can't do that? Yeah, you can't tune them? You can't show them how to do it? I mean, that would just obviate the... His objections, but you know, we, we yeah. need we need the the story to go a certain way. So So while we're on the subject of plot holes, two other major plot holes. Number one, um 
they he he says that they need to get a sample of the isotope that causes this. Why can't you get it from Neelix's body? Mm -hmm. Because that's where the isotope is. Mm -hmm. Second, even if you can't get enough of it from Neelix's body to be to be useful, once you've got it, you can make more of it and test that. Third problem, even if you need to go to the moon to get it, why haven't you done that already and just used a probe to scoop up atmosphere from the moon? From the moon? You don't need a fancy Alpha Quadrant transporter to do that. You can just use a probe. Right. We've, we've got, there's a, 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 a privately funded mission right now to go scoop up atmosphere from Venus and test it for life. You could have a probe. You're clearly more advanced than we are in space travel. You could just <laughs> take a probe to Rhinax, scoop up atmosphere, and get what you want. Right. Fourth, or whatever number I'm on now, <laughs> if you don't have a transporter, how have you been working on this plan? Because it's implied this is a long-term plan, and he, he's only just run across Voyager and its magical transporter. You clearly need transporter technology if you hope to reconstruct somebody, which is what the, the plan is to do. So you, you need a transporter to do that. How have you even detected that their, that their bio-whatevers are still intact enough to hope to put them together if you don't have a transporter? And if you do have a transporter, why do you need Voyagers? Right. Yes. Uh, all holes. Also, Voyagers apparently conveniently close to Telex. <laughs> Just yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Just happened so, to be passing by at that moment. Yes, yeah, in the neighborhood. Um, you mentioned before, Jimmy, that J Jutrell you know, says that the discovery that Cascade was inevitable for someone to discover. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes into this, this little bit of a soliloquy about um, he wants to have knowledge of how the world works and share that knowledge. And he did it for science and for his planet. And, you know, God help us <laughs> scientists who are all about the science, uh, you know, but he's mm -hmm. also a patriot. And uh, he, but he tells this affecting story like after the war. He goes home and his family left him because of it. Like he suffered the consequences mm -hmm. in his personal life at home. Yeah, there's a um, there's a parallel to that as well. Not with Hiroshima, not with the Second World War, but in the First World War. Um, there is a German scientist named Fritz Haber who uh, happened to be Jewish. And he developed two things that he is remembered for. One of them is ammo ammonium nitrate fertilizer which allowed humanity to so expand the crops it can produce that if we didn't have it today, billions of people would have to die. Mm -hmm. So he made an enormous contribution to, uh, to humanity by inventing nitrogen fertilizer that has allowed um, us to make more food than ever before in history and have more people alive than ever before in history. We could not sustain the present world population without it. So kudos to that. And he won the Nobel Prize for that. He mm -hmm. also, in World War II, sorry, World War I, invented chlorine gas Oof, as, mm -hmm. as a chemical weapon. And he was extremely proud of his chlorine gas. He was a patriotic German, and he, he, he was very happy about it being used to maim and kill people. Yep, and um, he also suffered um, in in his family situation as a result. His wife Clara committed suicide. Oh wow! Mm. Uh, it is it is thought in part because she was so horrified by the man she was married to and his devotion to his chemical weapons. Mm. Right. Uh, I mean, apparently Jutrell was not as devoted to it, but man, uh, uh, yeah. It, I, so I do like how this story kind of makes the horrors of war a little real in that sense. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't paper over them, mm -hmm. um, including Neelix's story that he tells about the injured girl th that he sees, you know, in yep. the blast. And uh, it was heart wrenching, frankly, to, mm -hmm. to hear that and uh, you know, to imagine it. So it was, um, again, well done with the writing. I, th I think that was added later. They did some rewrites and this was a later addition to the, to the rewrites. Um, there's, Jutrell says uh, at one point, again, Hiroshima connections, uh, the day we tested the cascade, when I saw that blinding light brighter than a thousand suns, I knew at that moment exactly what I had become. And in my head, I say, 
I had become death, destroyer of worlds, which is what Oppenheimer yeah. said when he saw exactly the from the Bhagavad bomb. Gita. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I wanted the reason I mentioned Haber was Jewish is um, he would not have fared well under the Nazis. No. Dis- no. Despite his German patriotism, fortunately for him, he actually died before the Nazis really broke out. Um, mm. and it did, so he he didn't have to live through the Holocaust. Right. Um. So uh, Neelix, as we mentioned. We have the big story twist as Neelix's admission that he was a draft dodger, essentially. Um, the, mm-hmm. the night of the cascade, he, he was not fighting somewhere else. He was hiding uh, and basically committed what we call today stolen valor, which is what we mm-hmm. call someone yeah. who pretends to have had uh, war honors Yeah, uh, when they don't. And it, you can see how, I mean, ordinary people, even people who are heroes, can have survivor's guilt. Mm-hmm. And that would be, so you would have survivor's guilt on steroids if you were hiding in Canada and all of your family was wiped out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, definitely. So he's angry for his shame and his guilt. And Kess thinks his anger at Jatrell is projection. Now, I mean, obviously there's real reason for anger at someone like Jatrell, but his over the top anger Mm -hmm. is is a kind of projection. Um, and then we have another twist. So I kind of like this. We, we, we have several oh, twists, uh, which b- is... Before, before we move on from that one, oh, okay. um, he, his, even though he was a draft dodger, his excuse was stupid <laughs> mm-hmm. um, because he says he thought the war was unjust. And I'm going, dude, your planet is being invaded. Yeah. How is it unjust to resist that? Even if you were wrong in starting the war... And mm-hmm. we're not told that the Talaxians started the war. Even if you were wrong in that, you're not wrong to defend your homeland and your people mm-hmm. from Metreon cascades. So the yeah. idea that um, the idea that this was unjust, and he kind of takes the edge off it by saying at least that's what he told himself. So okay, that's good, but man, that is a stupid reason. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Just admit you're afraid. I mean, that's you're afraid and. I mean, because he's already calling himself a coward. Maybe it's just a sign that he's still lying to himself in some small way uh, about being a co- about being a coward and being afraid. So uh, then we find that out. You know, the the next twist, which is that Jatrell is really running a secret experiment to bring back the people killed in the Cascade because they're not really dead; they're only mostly dead. They've been <laughs> dispersed into the Metreon cloud, and that yeah. he's going to use technology to bring other things back together again they're in a natural pattern buffer in essence yeah yeah in a in a universe in which the transporter exists i i'm gonna i'm gonna buy it i mean the transporter is implausible as it is so you may as well uh you know buy the natural transporter buffer thing Mm -hmm. um and so although it's they do point out i mean janeway is there when he reveals this and tuvok is there and both janeway and tuvok are like there are just too many factors. It is very unlikely that after 15 years, you're going to be put, able to put someone back together. Mm. Yeah. Although they almost they do. Almost, they <laughs> almost do. do it. And then it fails and then he dies. And it's really a bummer. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So he wants to use the DNA sequence of victims, which they have records of, to isolate the subatomic particles of particular individuals to reassemble them. And I'm thinking, how do you use DNA to isolate particular subatomic particles? Because DNA is atoms. <laughs> Like, well, and also, even if you grabbed everybody's, D- if even if you grabbed all of the all of the DNA of this person, that's just instructions to make yes. your cells. That doesn't give you the epigenetics to turn a, a, a an undifferentiated stem cell into a specific cell, like a heart cell or a liver cell. Um, and furthermore, even if you had all of this stuff, how do you know what order to put it together in? Right. And never mind the consciousness problems and, you know, yeah. the, the brain, the memories and all this stuff. You, well, what you'd have is a bunch of really nice looking corpses, basically. <laughs> so. I think you'd have a bunch of really ugly looking piles of cells. <laughs> right, right. Well, like that stuff in the jar. You got to remember you got the, the, mag- the magic device called the transporter that can figure the part of making an actual human body and, and taking a consciousness from, you know, this cloud yeah. and putting it into and yeah. Sucking the consciousness out of the cloud. Well, it doesn't work, uh, obviously, uh, which I think is. I think it it's not cheap grace. You know what I mean? If they, if it yeah. had worked and he was hero, yay! He's it's it doesn't give cheap grace. He he, it it gives us occasion for Jatrell to to die, not having succeeded, but yet having tried to do something good. 
and mm -hmm. Neelix to forgive, even though Jatrell doesn't actually accomplish the thing that he thinks deserves would be deserving of the forgiveness or whatever. Um, so I kind of like that they leave that kind of open. But mm -hmm. they, they kind of did it in a way of, well, the only reason why they weren't able to do it is because the transporter wasn't powerful enough. They couldn't get enough power into the transporter to do it. I mean, they show the person actually moving within the transporter signal, the yeah. transporter sheen, you know, sheen there. So it was working, but they just couldn't get enough power to the transporter, which means, well, you just need a more powerful transporter or multiple transporters. It's like, uh so it, they kind of take that back a little bit. A little bit, yeah. The, they leave it open-ended, like maybe someday someone could, you know, take his research and make it work. Actually make it work, yeah. Yeah. Though they don't say that. That's just inference on our part. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is, uh, Neelix does get, you know, his one of his last lines, the second to last line is, is maybe the cascade was a punishment for all of us for our hatred and our brutality, um, which, you know... Mm. Again, they were well. We don't know why the war started. Maybe the Talaxians, you know, caused it, <laughs> and they, that's where. And then we're invaded back. I mean, kind of like you mm -hmm. know, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, so it's possible, I suppose. Um, but it does end with him saying, uh, "Forgiving uh, Jatrell as he dies," which is uh, good. I think it's a good way to, yep. to end it. Uh, any yeah. uh, last thoughts, Father Corey? Nothing here, Jimmy. Talking about the. Um the idea that the, the Metreon cascade was a punishment for all of us. It reminds me of a line from the movie, uh, war of the gargantuas, which was a Japanese movie that was released in 1966. It's a kaiju film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it stars the American actor, Russ Tamblin, who is known for being short and <laughs> also for being the crazy psychiatrist on twin peaks. But he's playing a doctor in this movie and he's in Hiroshima. And maybe I'm getting this, I could be getting this confused with its, pre, with its predecessor, uh, Frankenstein Conquers the World. But um, there's a line where you have this American doctor talking to a Japanese nurse in Hiroshima. I guess it is in Frankenstein Conquers the World. And he's saying like, Hiroshima was a devastating tragedy, but at least it gave us the chance to study cells. <laughs> no, no, no. Wow. Let's just go with devastating tragedy. Yeah, stop. Um, End of sentence. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is uh, decent acting on Ethan Phillips's part in this episode as mm -hmm. Neelix. This mm -hmm. is this is one of the best of Neelix uh, episodes. Also, there's <laughs> Jatrell is so amazed by all these things in that the Voyager has. At one point, and this is actually the first time this happens, the doctor turns himself off, mm -hmm. you know, so right. he's not just left on in sickbay. Now, frankly, okay, my computer has a timeout. <laughs> so um, the idea that the doctor would just remain on in sickbay if no one turned him off is stupid. Um, he should be able to activate and deactivate himself constantly. He shouldn't even need to... Um, he, it should be like Alexa, you know, he, he shouldn't even need to have someone activate him. As soon mm -hmm. as you bring someone with bad physical symptoms into sickbay, he should activate. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So he should be much more, have much more agency in that regard than he does. Also, um, there are manual controls that they have. Uh, you don't have to do everything through a voice interface. Um, they have control panels in sickbay. Presumably there is an EMH on off button in the sickbay. <laughs> right. So all he would have to do, if you've got this magical hologram doctor, all he, at, even if he couldn't talk, he could just walk over, punch the off button for himself. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I find Jatrell's uh, being uh, gobsmacked by an EMH that can turn himself off to be thoroughly implausible. <laughs> well, and, and at this, even at this time, you know, in computers, you had sleep mode that was starting to come, become very popular at this time in computers. Uh, and you wouldn't even have to have someone, you know, come in with the injuries, just the door opens to right. sick bay and the hologram turns on. Cause we know we've got, you know, the smart doors that just walking by them is not enough to turn them on. You have to will that you want to go into the door for the door to open. So yeah, yeah I can tell, are you walking by or heading in? By yep. your angle of motion. 
Well, and even like, are you yeah. intending to go through the door? Or are you going to stand and talk for a little bit more <laughs> before you actually go through the door? Like if you're a cat going in and out. Uh, presumably, <laughs> if there were an actual medical staff still on board, they, they wouldn't need to reactivate it. But, you know, the, the, the system would be smart enough to know, you know, if the, if the doctors, if there is not a doctor in or nurse in sick bay, then activate the EMH when someone injured comes in. As soon as anyone thing. comes in. Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah exactly. All right, so uh, I think that does it for Jitrell. We Before we go, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Patrick G., Michael M., Deacon N., Chris F., and Nicholas S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest, and you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd like to thank Victor Lambs, who edited this episode. So that's it from us. We'd love to hear what you think of this Voyager episode, Jitrell. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek, our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. You can send an email to trek at sqpn.com or visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Enterprise episode, Acquisition. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Rule of acquisition number one, once you have their money, you never give it back. <laughs> and once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, Tom Terrific over here forgot to tell you that Sandrine's table rolls a little to the east. Tom Terrific, I like that. <laughs>